Welcome to everyone who is has joined us today for this webinar, communicating to your audiences post COVID. We are very lucky to have uh, these two outstanding women who have offered uh, their time and expertise to give to you on communicating on media relations and really how to deal with some of the intricate um, challenges that we're facing uh, with media and with our brands that we serve um, our own brand and our, our clients brands. So I'll, I'll start by uh, again, my name is Rachel Najarian. I'm the executive director of AWA and Elizabeth Yechtekian, uh, who I'll introduce first, is a new member to AWA uh, and has, along with Kristen Falder, ha had 15 to 20 years of agency and reporting experience, um, both together and separately. And Elizabeth shared with me, ironically, that though they work together in agencies and serving clients, they both coincidentally have several years of television reporting experience media I think Kristen you were in Tennessee and Elizabeth you were in New York and Michigan upstate so um, they share uh, have a lot in common have worked together and separately through the years with uh, clients across all areas venture capital fintech healthcare uh, and have now started their own agencies their own businesses serving clients and both work separately and together on that. So it's wonderful that you uh, get to do that. I think that's that's awesome when people stay in touch like that uh, and able to, it's a win-win for you. Uh, so uh, with no further ado, I am going to pass this to Elizabeth and Kristen to do the presentation. And what I'm gonna ask, uh, you all know you're off video and you are muted. Um, hopefully everyone knows where the Q&A box is at the bottom. Uh, I would appreciate if you used the Q&A box for your questions, uh, and I will do my best to vet those questions and to get them to Elizabeth and Kristen. If you do want to enter into the chat, that's fine, but we prefer the Q&A. It's much, it, it's much easier for us to moderate that way. Uh, so after their presentation, we will open up for Q&A, but feel free to add that question in at any time as you have it. And so you know this is being recorded, and so we will make it available uh, on our YouTube channel after this. So no further ado, take it away, Elizabeth and Kristen. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you so much. So um, just a quick overview of what we'll go through today um, is we're gonna talk through building a communications strategy in today's environment. And so many of you may have something like that already uh, at your organization that you've, um, implemented, designed, uh, have already been executing towards, um, but we'll walk through kind of how to dust it off and update it based on the current moment um, or how to do it if you haven't done that yet. And then we're also going to talk through how to communicate effectively to your audiences and we'll go through a couple different audiences um, and, and how to communicate to them specifically, such as investors, boards of directors, customers, etc. with a couple examples. And then, you know, at about 11.45 East Coast time, uh, we'll get into some Q&As. So please, as Rachel said, submit those to the Q&A box and and uh, we'll get started. So one of the things, we, we have this quote here, and I think that it is of utmost importance, I have before the pandemic, I think even more so now, that if communications is not a top priority, all of your other priorities are at risk. I know right now a lot of companies are eliminating or reducing budgets in marketing, um, external communications, sometimes even internal communications, and I know that I'm a little bit biased, and so is Elizabeth, given this is what we do for a living. I um, think that that's probably not where the cuts should come. It's um, of utmost important to make sure that your communication strategy is as strong as ever in order to make sure that you're communicating with all of your audiences. And so for us, we're always trying to push our clients and partners and uh, people that we counsel to make sure that they're putting communications first. So right now we are at such an interesting time in history and as communicators, and there is, I think, an innate uh, impulse to retreat, meaning when this first started in March and those sort of bleak days uh, when everything started shutting down with the pandemic, 
you know, I think a lot of companies went dark in a way from a communication standpoint. And, and some of our clients were very, very reluctant to go out to media or to go out uh, with anything, you know, external um, if they didn't have to. And so what we, we like to tell people is, Fight that urge because there is a there is a position for you to have. There is a story. There is a message to your employees, to the media, to your stakeholders, whomever your audience is. Uh, it's just finding that story. And some of the most resilient companies have found those stories to tell during the pandemic and have pivoted and have been resilient. So, yes, we want folks. We tell our clients we want you to have a pandemic centric story to think about what's happening so you're, you don't appear to be tone deaf but not to go away, not to just, you know, shut down completely in, in terms of communicating. And I'll jump in there real quick, Elizabeth. And, and like Rachel mentioned at the beginning of this, where, you know, we have the pandemic, which started here in the States around March, but then a lot of social movements like the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, the police brutality, which started, you know, a couple, a, a month or so ago. Time, time is very funny right now. Um, and, you know, a lot of companies feel like they need to rush to put a statement out or they need to, to rush to say something. And it's not that you don't have to say something, but you know, we just don't want you, know, to, you to retreat completely, but it, it's just being thoughtful. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute about what it is that you're saying. Um, you don't have to shut the, you don't have to lock yourself inside the office and shut the shutters <laughs> and right. be quiet and say, I, I don't wanna talk about it because I don't wanna get in trouble that's, you know, the wrong thing to talk about. And in Elizabeth certain, and I were, go ahead. Sorry. Certain industries are rebounding. I mean, there mm. is, you know, not every industry has taken such a, a dive. And so, for example, a lot of the companies that we work with are technology companies. And one, one sector that is really on fire right now is telehealth, right? So it's no surprise how um, we work with a startup that helps their clients, their, their, their basically um, huge hospitals, small small practices, different kinds of healthcare institutions across the U.S., how do they communicate with their patients? And so they, they have a telehealth uh, solution. And so we've been telling some stories to media around that. And so obviously there's a, there's a rich story there, right? There's an applicable story that makes sense for people because it has to do with, with COVID. Um, it's, not, it's not just making a link for making a link uh, sake. It's, it's actual you know, business. It makes sense how they are reaching clients texting them instead of having them come in um, about you know triage things that can be done over a phone um, screening them before they come in for the, the appointment things like that we also want folks to take a breath <laughs> before doing any of this um, on the other side we see some companies uh, and i'm sure you've all seen this too you know going out with a message just because it has something to do with COVID, but it may not even be a smart message or a message that makes sense for their business. So we want you to think about what is your company's vision? What is it before COVID? And, and can you pivot and make it something that is applicable in a natural way, in a, in a way that is logical um, to, to reach your audiences? So on one hand, we're saying, uh, you know, don't hide, don't put the shutters down, but at the same time, we don't want you to just go out and and the same for Black Lives Matter and, and, and these other huge issues of our times. If you have a coherent message that makes sense, that you can back up with facts, that's substantive, we want you to have that message and tell it. We don't want you to just throw sort of wallpaper on your, on your, uh, on your homepage of your website saying that you support Black, Black Lives Matter or you support uh, your, your, your customers through COVID if you don't have actual examples to back it up. Yeah, and a, and a good example there is the one that Elizabeth was just talking about, the, the client that we work with that's in the healthcare technology space. And she mentioned that they have a telehealth solution. They didn't at the beginning of this. They, you know, they worked quickly. So to talk about this slowdown, they worked um, overnight through, you know, through the days to develop something. But their mission is delivering and enabling access to healthcare for patients. And so they have a messaging platform which allows doctors um, at health systems, at small practices, communicate to their patients easily and seamlessly in a way that their patients want. So mostly via text, but other, other channels as well. And when the, the COVID pandemic hit, they thought, how can we continue to build on our mission of access 
and they realized that they could build a telehealth solution that was easier to use for the doctors and patients than those that existed already and could just be plopped on top of their platform for existing customers or new customers. And so they went into it and they deployed and executed quickly, but they took that second at the beginning to say, what is our vision? What is our mission? And how can we continue to build our solution and then communicate that solution externally? And so it was really important. They, they slowed and then went super fast, <laughs> which I think is important. Um, so that communications plan that we talked about at the beginning, which is so important. And again, a lot of organizations should already have one. And so in this case, they shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't have a communications plan that uh, your marketing team or your PR agency deliver or develops and then it sits on a shelf. This is something that should be constantly evaluated and dusted off and added to and evolved. Um, and so now is no different. We're in an interesting time. A lot of people keep using the word unprecedented. And so it requires a little bit more of an update, but just the same as, as we should be doing. And so over on the right is are some of the, the items that should be included in that, that uh, plan. So you have obviously your messaging, but you have that pandemic messaging. And so that should be added there. You don't have to create a new messaging platform, but like Elizabeth said before, this is different. And so when she was talking about not retreating, you have this opportunity to speak to your audiences from a new lens now, this pandemic lens. And so one example is if you're in IT security, for example, and we are now seeing also, you know, we're all working remotely, which is increasing risks for security across the board. And so if you're an IT security company, you might go, I don't have anything to say about COVID and the pandemic. That's false, right? You do have something to say. You have a lot to say about um, how to ensure security and uh, you know everything for your employees to your companies and what your employees should know so that's best tip best practices and tips and insights and so you really want to take a step back like Elizabeth just said slow down and say what are our messages in the current moment what value do we add and offer to our audiences and then write that down and make sure that everybody is aligned for that and then from there, what's your content calendar? How are you getting that out? Through which channels are you using? Your media strategy, and we'll show you an example of how a client of ours is using the media to communicate with their customers. Um, traditional marketing efforts, those newsletters and ways of communicating with your clients and customers and prospects already. Um, customer engagement strategy, obviously you wanna make sure that you are communicating to them more than ever. And especially as in that example that I just gave, if you're an IT security company, you wanna make sure that you're offering insights and best practices and tips proactively to those customers. And so they feel that they're in a partnership with you and they're not starting to look for other vendors. And then crisis planning. Um, no matter what, if we're in a pandemic or not, you should have a crisis plan. And we'll talk a little bit about that, what that can look like. But um, especially now, you never know what's going to happen. Have something, know how to execute. And you'll know when you don't have one. <laughs> so we always tell people, and we'll get into that, you should always have a, a crisis plan, you know, no matter how small or, or larger organization is, no matter if it's during COVID, if it's not during a pandemic, you should always have a plan. How you would deal with a crisis, whether it's an employee, uh, whether it's a security breach, um, things like that. Exactly. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the formula for dealing with that publicly um, and then can answer questions, obviously, later. Um, along the same lines of what we've been talking about, scaling back, not eliminating. Um, we pulled a couple examples that have just, you know, it's, it's interesting. I know my mom keeps talking about how, how fascinating it is to see how companies and people evolve and innovate and create during times like this. And I am inspired every day by just emails that I get from our local library and our local zoo here in Nashville. And so if you stop to think about just a couple of these examples, and they're everywhere, you know, public libraries, digital content, zoos, I can go and stream and, you know, watch what's happening to the animals today with my kids. Schools obviously have had one of the biggest lifts and shifting to virtual learning when all they've been doing is, is in person. Um, event companies, 
are writing guides on best practices for virtual meetings when all they've done for the past 50 years is in-person meetings. And, you know, dance studios offering outdoor classes. And so you can see in some of these examples, they might get your, your mind and juices flowing about what is possible when you stop for a second and recognize, kind of look at what it is that you offer and what you're doing for a as a company, as an organization, or for people that you lead, and how it can be put through the, the current lens. Um, Women's Wear Daily here, you know, they say getting creative on social media might be the best way. Um, that's not going to be the best way for every company, but um, it's an easy way for you to stay out there and share those messages. And I would also add, just from our own company, Kristen and I um, do a fair bit of as we mentioned, we work with companies to help them find their media strategy and implement that strategy. But we also do a lot of media training and preparing people for the interview itself. And now we're doing that all virtually. So it doesn't sound like a huge pivot, a big catapult to do that from going in person, hopping on the train, or Kristen and for Kristen, you know, flying out to New York to do media training. Now we're doing those trainings. We just trained uh, a few people last week, about six people remotely. From most of, most of them were based on the West Coast. And you know we did what we normally would do, but we had five people all on the Zoom call. So it's 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 even as as in the basic example of how we've changed and pivoted during COVID. Yeah, and and to Elizabeth's point, tweak, tweaking how we deliver that, um, but also the messages there saying if you're going to be doing a media interview via video, how do you need to to get your space ready and your camera angles? And so it's just taking what we do normally and just tweaking it for the current moment. So. Over to you, Elizabeth, on the on the crisis. Yeah, so crisis, we talked about, you'll know when you don't have a crisis plan, when you have a crisis. So you want to always have a plan. And, it, you know, sometimes it, it gets, crisis planning sounds like this big, you know, sort of uh, scary thing that, that clients sometimes ask us about as if it's this big thing to prepare for. We always say this, a crisis plan is basically saying how you're going to deal with a problem, the steps you will take, to, to deal with the problem and what you will do better the next time. So it's 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 recognizing what went what went wrong and and communicating to your whether it's your investors, your employees, the media, how you're going to fix it in the, in the future. And there's in throughout history many examples of this done well and some very much rogue. So you know fleeing the scene of an accident without communicating to authorities not a good way to deal with a crisis. Um, British Petroleum CEO a few years back, you know, saying he wanted his life back uh, as a way when he addressed the media about what was happening in the South. So not great ways, right? Very defensive, these, these two things I, I gave examples of. Um, but what we tell clients is always have a plan, be straightforward. If you've done something wrong, apologize. Again, very basic things, but it's not something that you that we see a lot of. Crisis is not done well usually. Um, so we never ever want to see our clients say no comment. No comment to employees, no comment to, to media that does not work is very defensive. So uh, communicating often, communicating uh, with the same message, uh, making sure the other folks in the organization also have that messaging. So you know, starting at the top, getting messaging locked and loaded and communicating to the, everyone else in the organization what that message is. Consistency is your friend during a crisis, as it would be in any other crisis in your life. If you think about um, you know, personal matters or things like that, you know, having everybody on the same page is really helpful, and it's, it's no different in, in a professional setting. Yeah, and you know, in, in terms of kind of what should be in that plan, what it should look like, you know, Elizabeth just mentioned, you know, you want it's kind of like, you know, when, when there's a snow day at your kid's school and they have the, the, phone, the phone chain, right? And everybody gets the call or, or however it is that that works. The crisis plan needs to be the same thing. You know, if we have a crisis, you know, um, uh, an internal employee crisis, who's going to speak to that? Is that the CEO? If we have an external um, crisis, is that the CEO or, or do you have something, you know, where you have the CMO or the COO or the CTO or the CFO and you identify each of the executives that's going to speak to what kind of crisis that you that you come into contact with and you know and then you you have to to make sure you have down your audiences and i think this is one of the areas as a communications professional that a lot of people overlook um you you know it's easy to overlook some of your audiences you may say mm -hmm. 
you know, I need to, to communicate with shareholders and uh, customers, but then you forget employees, right? Or you forget um, employees' families, right? Like there's, there's all these. And so really taking time to sit down and say, who are all of our audiences if we have a crisis and who's going to communicate to them um, and what is the time frame? And, and you just kind of, those are some of the components that uh, you need to, that you need to start with. Um, who's going to be the speaker on which topics, you know, what crises are you likely to face or could come in contact with and who are those key audiences? Um, not just the key, who are all of the audiences that you need to communicate to? Those should all be key in that. And it takes time. It's not something that you just, that day when the crisis hits, you just say, okay, John will be our spokesperson, Helen will handle employees and, you know, let's go. Like it doesn't work that seamlessly. So you want to have your messages and you want to have your spokespeople and you want to have your, your tailored audiences sorted out before the crisis hits. So it's being yeah. proactive, not reactive, not defensive, not scrambling uh, last minute. And Elizabeth, like you said, uh, the training. So, you know, we, we often train people ahead of, you know, we, we would like people to be prepared to speak to the media before a crisis, <laughs> if possible, right? So we do a lot of, when we do media training, that's one of the things that we're doing is trying to get people ready to, to, to have these conversations. And so here is a slide that's quite helpful and it just basically is a checklist of things that you need um, to communicate during a pandemic. And you can take a look here on the screen, but I mean, we talked a little bit about this Put, you know, push pause, like we don't want you running out with a message that just is sort of um, after the fact that you just think you need a message and here it is. We want it to make sense. We want it to represent what you do and also represent the audiences that you're trying to reach. So thinking about what the message is, thinking about your company's vision pre-pandemic and, and tailoring it uh, to these times. We want you to know your audience is so important. I mean, not just during a pandemic, but of course, all of you have diff you come from different fields and, and different uh, lines of experience, but your audiences, I'm pretty sure you know who your audiences are. You know, it's, it's crucial to understand those audiences now and how they may have changed and what, what do they need from you that's different because it's changed all of, all of our lives. It's changed how we work, how we work, how our children go to school, um, how we care for our elders in our life. So thinking about your audiences in that way as well. Um, things have changed for them, right? Your customers, your customers day to day has changed uh, as, as yours have. And, and one thing, um, sorry, Elizabeth, I just wanna to add to that. You know, one thing that in Elizabeth and mine's work, which is really interesting, is a lot of times people will say, you know, my audience is healthcare, right? We, we were on a call with a prospect a couple of weeks ago and, and that's what he said, my, my audience is in healthcare healthcare is huge, right? Like healthcare is systems and healthcare is small providers and healthcare is oncology and endocrinology. Like, you know, healthcare um, is a vast, vast industry within itself. And so there are um, industry, there, there are audiences within healthcare. And so it's, it's always surprising to me how many companies have not really drilled down into very specific audience segments. And so we can often take for granted that people do, um, but doing this work right now is really important to actually sit down and say, okay, you know, are they, you know, IT professionals in a certain sector and, and you know, what did that, what does that look like? And so, uh, sorry, Elizabeth, I just, you know, it's funny how important and critical that piece is and how sometimes organizations just get into the rhythm and sometimes forget to stop and really home, home in on who those, those, those audiences are, what they look like and, and things they do and where they spend their time. Definitely, and I think that goes to the, the next point about you know, what are your new business goals? What, what has changed for you um, and, and your customers, right? Everything is changing, everything is pivoting uh, during these times, so making sure you, you think about that as you go. And you know, none of this is, we've never done this before. So I always say to clients, this is the first time around for us and for you as the client and, and for your client's clients. So um, being able to pivot, but also try something. And if it doesn't work, we adjust. Um, re, you know, being agile right now is super important. Being, being also, um, I don't want to say easy on yourself, but understand that this is new for all of us, right? So this is uncharted territory, as we say, the word unprecedented is being used quite a bit these days, but it's true. And so what may work now 
uh, it may not work in September, right? I mean, we, we're looking at how schools are now changing once again, and the plans are coming forward. We were talking at the beginning of the call uh, around how each state has a different, you know, rollout plan for schools, obviously. So things are changing really week by week um, and could see another surge. We could see um, a vaccine here uh, in January. So, you know, uh, understanding that we are in a fluid situation and, and what may work now may, may not work even in a, in a few weeks. And that's a good point, Elizabeth, and one that I just uh, had is, you know, if you deal with regional customers, right, if you're selling into customers in Michigan versus customers in California versus customers in Florida, you know, every, all of those places have, have unique needs and, and pain points and everything, but especially right now, right, if you're selling into somebody in Florida, a life looks really different in Florida mm -hmm. as it does to in Michigan. And so that is another uh, intricacy and another challenge or layer that we've that you know you add on to what we're currently facing and goes to that we have to be flexible right we have to we have to do a little bit of research and then we have to go if that didn't work let's try something else because to elizabeth's point we haven't been here we before. haven't done this before there's no play there's no playbook right we're we're creating the playbook and i think it's like the point parenting. about the regional yes and, and the point <laughs> about the regional differences is really really important What's going to work for customers in one state won't work in the, in, for others. And, and it's changing. Like It's changed. You know, first, the hotspot was New York, and it was Massachusetts. And now it's blurred in California and Texas. And so if your customers are in those hotspots, their lives are changing daily. And you know, it, it, so keeping that in mind, regional differences are, are key right now. Yeah. So from the, the communications plan, so we obviously talked through, you know, some of the items that should be in there, what that should look like, why it's important to, to either um, dust it off or create one at this moment, and some of the things that you should be focused on. Now we'll talk through a little bit about communicating effectively to the different audiences, uh, what that might look like. And so one of the things that's really important in any communication um, to any audience that you're speaking to is we have a few bullet points here. There's more, of course, but here are some top ones is that, you know, what is your game plan? Elizabeth and I talk about this all the time when we train people to speak with the media and, and we'll get into media as an audience a little bit in, in a little bit. But what what are you going to say? What are your key messages? Let's have three to five points that you want to get across in any conversation, in any message that you're delivering, whether it's to customers or employees or, um, you know, investors. And so you need to start that opportunity with a game plan. And really important is what you want that audience to walk away knowing and feeling. Emotion, as we all know, and we're all learning over the past several years, we're doing a lot of work into behavioral research and behavioral decisions, feelings play more often than um, rational decision making. So to Elizabeth's point, ask yourself, how does this fit into your vision? And then develop messages accordingly. And so again, going back to the example that we said, you know, if your mission is to enhance accessibility to healthcare, what are you saying about that nowadays through the pandemic lens? And what solutions are you creating? And how are you helping your customers deliver that in prospects? Be clear and concise in those messages, don't waver. And um, what you don't wanna do is be inconsistent and have people catch you in that. That is, that's a trap and that's a, that's a big one. And then be clear on the call to action. What do you want each audience to do? Each audience is gonna be different for you and you're gonna want them to do different things. Be clear on that so that the conversation or you know, discussion doesn't end and they walk away going, what is it? The, what was the point of that conversation? What do I need to do? So be clear on that. I think the, the point, the fourth point on that slide is so important when we talk about, yeah. you know, be consistent with your messaging. Sometimes we talk to people uh, at, at a, in a company and the CEO says something very different than the CMO or the CTO and making sure that your C-level suite or whomever your spokespeople are have the same message is so important, but it, it's very rare that it happens. In a training we did last week, we were so happy and surprised that the folks we trained, we trained five folks from different backgrounds same company and they, they all said the same thing about what their company's values were and that is so very rare and you know it, it sounds like it would be obvious like yeah this is how we describe our company this is who we represent this is these are our values but it's it's very rare that all those people say this very similar thing so making sure that whomever the spokesperson is um, if there's several like make sure they have consistent messaging I, I think Elizabeth 
you know, I don't think that that can be overstated. Uh, when when Elizabeth says we media train, you know, this is you know this is something that Elizabeth has been doing for 15 years and rarely has heard spokespeople from the same company say the same message. And you know, we're we're about to put a, a blog post together on that topic because when we did training last week, that was so. It, we noticed it because it is so rare. And so I, I don't want to, you know, I, I, Elizabeth Broadbrook, I think that it's important for every company to recognize. And when we talk about audiences, you know, we're, we're training people for media, that's a specific, you know, audience of the media. But, you know, you think about it from, for employees, you know, as a CEO, are your messages the same as, you know, the HR, like the, the head of HR and versus the managers that you have managing the teams? And I think that that's really important because if it's not, if you say, like, if I said, if we, you know, rolled out a vision or rolled out, you know, a new vision for our company, would the way I present it be the same way as the way that my managers would present it? And if the answer is no, um, you have a key answer to, to figure out how to get that so that the answer is yes. Um, I mean, we were shocked and right. we've been doing this for a it's long not, time. It's, it's <laughs> It sounds like something you would just assume, like, yeah, of course, they're all, they're all spokespeople yeah. and all going to say the same thing about the company. The company's not that big. Um, so yeah, it's a no brainer. And it really isn't. I mean, I've, like you said, I've been doing this for a long time. We've been doing these trainings for, for years and years and it, it doesn't happen. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, like you said, it's a no brainer and people just brush over it. So I, I wanted to make sure we didn't. <laughs> So these different audiences, we break them down and we understand that um, you, you all have very different backgrounds. Some of these audiences may not be applicable, but we, we took a stab at, you know, sort of basic audiences out there. And, you know, with investors, you want to, I would say, over communicate, especially now, um, communicating more than less is, is, is very, very important. As with any audience, listening, um, actively listening, not talking to uh, someone is so very important. I think investors particularly do appreciate this uh, particular skill set. Uh, of course, when you're speaking to investors, you want to tell the truth. Uh, we want you to tell the truth to any audience, um, but um, being factual, backing things up with, uh, with evidence, uh, figures, things like that is, is particularly important to these folks, uh, concrete examples. Um, sometimes uh, we work with some startups that may not want to say all that's happening with, with what they're seeing with their customers, or um, they might want to sort of put a shiny bow on some things that are, may not be great. Uh, we don't want you to hide the bad news. We want you to be straightforward and, um, you know, sounds very obvious, but tell the truth, right? Um, and, you know, relying solely on email is something that I think for any audience, but especially investors, pick up the phone. I think that this, this crew particularly particularly appreciates a phone call. And so much of our communication for any industry, for any, audio, any audience is via email. And we were saying at the top of the call, it's, it's really, now it's over Zoom, it's over Zoom video, mm -hmm. um, more and more with, with pandemic um, changing how we communicate. But picking up a phone call, pick, sorry, picking up a, uh, the phone and communicating is kind of an old school um, you know, way of communicating, but I think this, this group particularly does appreciate that. Well, and Elizabeth, you know, the, the group that we trained last week were venture capitalists. They were, they were VC partners. And so just having the conversation with them about what life is like and how things have changed, um, you know, they, they really are, are very involved. They're having check-ins with their founders uh, and their portfolio companies. They're, you know, having conversations with them about whether they should take the PPE, the PPP, excuse me, and the, you know, how they're navigating their way through the current time. And so, it's really important that those conversations continue to be had um, in a very transparent way so that all of the parties are on the same page and, and aligned. And so, yeah, I mean, like, like Elizabeth, we're, we're all adapting. And so Zoom and, and phone calls, they said they're having phone calls more than ever before. Right. It's like the old fashioned ways are coming back. It's so funny yeah. to think of the phone as old fashioned. <laughs> but I know. It, it's like you would just, I feel like pre pandemic, everything would be email. Yep. And maybe you do a phone, you do, of course you do, you do, of course you do phone, you know, conference calls and things, but I feel, I feel like now for every audience, it's very much get on the Zoom, which is yep. great, very transparent. And I think you want to be very transparent with investors. Yep. Yeah. And um, board of directors, you want to speak to them? Yeah, of course. And I think that's, it's a very similar group. 
I do think that, you know, communicating with, if you're communicating to a board of directors, what I've noticed is that having someone from the outside that can bring a different opinion that does not belong to the organization is very, very helpful. Um, I've served on a couple of boards and I think, you know, having that outside voice that, that is, uh, is not so, I want to say they're kind of objective, subjective rather. They're not, um, they're not really, they, they don't have as much skin in the game, right? So being able to, to bring someone out in, into the organization that might help them that way is, is really valuable. Um, but again, you know, I, like I said, at the, the other side, communicating, um, being honest, um, talking about what are the issues that, that, that are facing the board. I mean, very important things to do. Sometimes not every board member wants to hear uh, the truth. Uh, sometimes uh, people have, or, or there's different conversations going on with other members of the board, but being able to communicate, you know, uh, effectively and widely with what's really happening is, is super important right now. And uh, again, Zoom has played a great, uh, it's been a great way to do that. I mean, it's definitely, I want to say level the playing field in terms of communicating to everybody at the same time. So everybody's hearing the same story. And it's really, I think spontaneous meetings are popping up. The only thing I would say about that is making sure that all board members are able to attend those sort of pop-up Zoom calls because we're seeing folks say, well, I didn't know we were having this meeting. Um, yeah, you know, in person, it used to be that you would know in person, it would be like, there would be four meetings each quarter or one meeting each quarter and you would know about it. Now we're seeing these meetings pop up left and right, but making sure you've got, you know, as many people as you can. Yeah, and, and like Elizabeth said at the beginning, and and this can't be overstated is that you know communication is not a one-way street right there there it's absolutely a two-way street and so listening is as important sometimes more important than doing the talking so when we're talking about employees as an audience this is a really important one obviously you want to retain uh you want to retain employees you want to attract the right employees you know talent is is really hard to find and important and critical to businesses um, but also in today's world, and we know this with the social movements like Black Lives Matter and um, also, you know, when acquisitions happen, employees are the first ones who can break the news and they have Twitter, they have Facebook, they have Instagram, they have all sorts of ways now to communicate about your company that you don't have control over. And so there are really critical audience if they they were always really critical and nowadays because they have all of these tools at their disposal it's really important that uh, we're communicating to our employees um, clearly and accurately um, being clear and concise understanding your employees so this goes to understanding uh, you know what it is that they want uh, getting feedback collecting feedback listening to that feedback you know the feedback loop in communication is really important letting employees know that they have a voice that you're taking what it is that they say and then you're going to implement and act on it so that communication comes full circle of if you're asking them questions then you're going to give them you know the actions that come from that that's really um, that closed loop is really important um, which is you know matching actions with words regular communication, especially right now when people are fearful of their jobs, their livelihoods, everything is so uncertain. Make sure that you communicate more than less. And, you know, as much as you can create those opportunities for relationship building with face-to-face, -face, um, whatever that looks like right now. Uh, and then the other audiences is customers. And we had talked about this a little bit before that we would present um, an example here. But with customers, what's really important is that empathy and authenticity. Um, you know, there was a study that just came out uh, looking at Gen Z and uh, millennials, buyers, and, you know, what helps create loyalty with them. And overwhelmingly, it's authenticity. They can sniff it out. They can see if a brand is being too marketing um, and selling to somebody and not real. Um, don't say that you're sustainable if you're not, right? Like these things matter to the generation that's going to be spending money. And so you want to make sure that you're real in your communication. Um, communicate to add value. And so here's an example of the client we had mentioned that's in the healthcare tech space that now has a telehealth example um, or offering. But um, they also, like we said, their, their main offering is a platform to communicate for, for hospitals and doctors and providers to communicate with their patients. And so uh, we helped them get this, they use the media as the channel. 
and wrote this article about four ways that practices can recoup lost revenue. And so this is an, a message for their customers, their clients and prospects who are in private practice. We used uh, a media channel that speaks to that customer um, channel and audience and wrote an article that was basically, you know, giving them these four ways that they can implement that. So it's that value. Every time you communicate, whether it's a newsletter, don't just share information about your company, how can customers use that information? And this is the perfect example of how they leveraged media to do that. Um, ask, listen, and then share your learning so that other customers can learn from other customers. And uh, this one is really make it simple to find advice and insights. If somebody's going for best practices or you know how to find how to generate new revenue as a as a practice, I want the customer to be able to find this article quickly and and easily or a newsletter that I sent over. Um, you don't want to make them look hard. And if they are searching and they're finding a competitor, that's a problem. So. And media, we talked a lot about media. That's a big part of what Kristen and I do for work. We used to be reporters and now we help our clients um, uh, create stories uh, and tell stories to media. So we always tell folks that when we look at the media landscape, it's very, it's very similar to what we said at the beginning. You wanna have consistent messages with media. You wanna make sure that you're saying the same thing um, that somebody else in the organization would say. And you want to back up what you're saying with examples. Media want to hear, whether it's you know, during times of, of a pandemic or not, they want to hear from your customers. So they, you may have a great offering as a, as a company, but they want to hear from your customers, right? So they always want to tell the story around something that appeals to masses, that impacts their audience. So if it's USA Today, maybe your company's helping with something like a telehealth uh, solution or something else. They would love to hear about that solution, but they'd love to talk to the doctor that's um, using that to, to reach patients. So it's, it's, it's really making sure the story is told through the lens of a customer and showing how it actually impacts the broader audience and society. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of competition right now for those stories to be told. We have a saturated news market that is uh, a news cycle, I should say, that is just getting more and more frenzied with uh, the things that are happening this summer and also the upcoming election, obviously, in November. And things will change and change again. The media are just really haven't caught their breath from the 2016 election. And you think that is just going to become more and more frenzied as we continue on. So making sure you have a crisp story that you can back it up uh, with rich examples, the touch points of how your customers are uh, li living better lives uh, or are impacted is really, really strong. And, you know, we talked about authenticity at the beginning. They will know if you're not authentic. They will know if you if you're just sort of putting a band-aid on something or you don't really have a message around Black Lives Matter or COVID and you're just sort of trying to have that message. Um, reporters get, you know, up to 50 pitches a day from people in public relations like ourselves that are pitching the media. So you want to stand out and you want to set it up in a way that they'll be, you know, enticed to do your story. So helping them do their job um, is really, really important. And, you know, like, like we had said with the customers is demonstrating and offering value in every touch point, the media have an audience. So, you know, a writer at the New York Times mm -hmm. has one audience and the writer at Information Week or eWeek has a different audience. And so it's really important to understand what the audience is looking for from that particular reporter or media outlet and then delivering that, right? So it's, you know, to Elizabeth's point, they're, they're going to sniff out if you're inauthentic. But at the same time, if you're offering insights or value to their readers, that their readers are going to say, I want to come to read this article, then that offers value to the reporter and then that begets coverage, right? So it's, a, it's a really important. It's understanding that audience and yeah. understanding their audience so that you can speak to that audience through them. Um, this example that we have here goes back to Elizabeth talking about crisis. And we just thought it was such a good example. And if you want to go look it up and read the article after, I would, I would suggest doing so. Um, basically, it, it followed the formula that Elizabeth laid out, is when you get caught in the middle of something, when it's a crisis, you, you admit it. You do not lie about it, right? We have seen over and over in Washington uh, that you will always get caught if you lie. 
um, you own it. We did it. You apologize. We're sorry for doing that. We learned from it. Here's what we learned from it. And most importantly, what are you going to do about it? Right? These are the like the four things, right? Own it, apologize, um, or, or own it. It's like category three, own it, apologize, and then talk about the plans for moving forward. And you can spend the most time on that ladder where you're talking about the plans for moving forward, because that's where you want people to focus about, but you need to do those, those things. And then we sort of end the presentation with a checklist. And I think the media is, we wrap this up around you know, the media, but any, any communications during a pandemic, it's sort of a, a, a catch-all, right? We want you to um, try to get your points across in a very concise way. We want you to maintain control, <clears throat> excuse me, of your message. Um, what we mean by that is you may get rattled as a spokesperson. The reporter may or may not be educated on your topic or what you do. So you may have to educate them as, as you go along in the interview, and that might, um, you may get rattled or impatient during that process. So we want you to stay in control and stay calm. Um, we want you to tell the truth, as we said, we, we don't want folks um, saying things that aren't true. Uh, we talked about remaining calm, that's super important. If a reporter is driving the interview, um, it's, it's tough to remain calm, especially if they're peppering you with difficult questions. So how do you, how do you stay um, poised and, and handle difficult questions? And there's a whole training on that. We, you know, there's techniques called blocking and bridging, blocking the negative and bridging to where you want to go in the interview so you control the interview and go to the points that you want to get to. Um, we also talk about body language, so important, especially now uh, with, with everything being on Zoom and video, you know, you're being seen, you, we used to just pick up the phone and, and do a conference call. Now a lot of reporters want to do the video interviews, even though they may not use the video for um, playback in their story, it's, or a link in their story, it's, you know, hey, let's just hop on a Zoom really quickly. So you should be prepared to be on a video call if you do an interview with a reporter. We're seeing that more and more. And it's just a lot easier for the reporter to then um, record the video and play it back um, for them for note taking and things like that. So we tell folks to be prepared for that. Um, we also want people to be like ready to provide customer examples. We talked about that. Um, you know, who can you put the reporter in touch with? Kristen mentioned, you know, you may have someone who can really add value to what they do or think a thought leader on your team may be super valuable to the media. Um, getting them in, you know, getting them in touch with people, having that ready, those resources ready. Maybe it's an analyst that covers your space. Maybe it's a reporter or excuse me, a um, customer. Um, and maybe it's a report that you found particularly helpful about the industry. Being able to share those resources quickly and, and anticipate the needs of the reporter. And then this other uh, side here is, you know, it's, these are more techniques. Um, there's a whole presentation on this, but it's listening, actively listening to the question that's being asked of you, but providing your answer. That's, a, a, that's something that takes practice. We've all had job interviews where we get caught up in the question that's being asked of us, but we don't necessarily give the answer we want to because we're focused on that question. So there's a, a way that we can, uh, a technique that we can really listen to the question, but give our answer. And so that's super important, especially with media who want, often want something like a juicy headline, um, more clicks for a story. So they're going to look for that sensational information or that contrarian view uh, to sell a story to get more social shares. So always being aware that, you know, they're looking for that juicy trend or, or headline. And these other uh, things here is obviously avoid arguments <laughs> during interviews. This happens sometimes, uh, a rogue reporter or maybe an ed, maybe a, maybe a reporter that's been doing this a long time and sort of likes to get the spokesperson going, um, will start sort of being very antagonistic. And they do this on purpose to get sort of the emotion and that's gonna sell the story for the reporter. So remaining calm, not arguing if the reporter is, is acting kind of cagey, you know, just staying super composed and calm is really important. And these other points below, talking in short sentences, there's a reason for that. Reporters love sound bites, but they're also taking uh, notes of what you're saying. So being able to set up your answers in three clear ways, like these are the three things that matter most to me right now for my industry, or these are the three trends we're seeing when it comes to healthcare today. You know, so the reporter is going to write down those three things. So it becomes a very practical way to flag to the reporter, hey, this is something important. Get ready to, to listen. And obviously Zoom helps us now because we can do the video playback, but um, Super, think, you know, super important things to remember because uh, often we're communicating very complex things. I'm sure your industries vary. Some, um, I'm sure, are technical and, and, and things like that. So being able to really summarize in a succinct way 
that the average person, that's the audience of this publication or, or um, online outlet could understand. And again, that takes some practice. And, yeah. you know, being, being super clear, you know, that's, that's hard sometimes, especially when we're communicating complex things, or maybe sometimes communicating, uh, you know, un, not, I don't want to say unpleasant, but, you know, sometimes the, the message might not be great, right? How do you communicate an unpleasant message around layoffs, for example, or, um, you know, a crime that's occurred at, at the workplace or something like that? So making sure you're, you know, being super clear in your communication is, is really important. So you don't want to look like you're hiding something if the message if the message isn't so great. And then just the last two points, um, you know, if you're not clear, um, maybe correcting yourself as you go. I think a lot of times people feel when they're being interviewed, they feel very obliged to answer the question. And maybe they aren't being clear or they recognize they're not being clear, but they so just want the question to be over or the interview to be over that they just, maybe they don't correct something that wasn't true or something that didn't come out as clear. So we always want you to, you know, feel free to one, ask for clarification of the question itself. Or if you feel like you answered in a fun, in a way that wasn't truthful or not even intentionally that you wanted to do that, but in a way that wasn't super clear, um, give yourself the chance to correct it. You have the, you have the ability to do that and ask a question back to the reporter or, or ask for clarification or correct what you said. So always remember that you do have that power during an interview, that, that opportunity. And, you know, be open to feedback. Um, you know, that's hard these days, especially as we're, we're all doing this new way of communicating and it's, there's no playbook for this. And we talked about this, you know, a lot through this presentation, but, you know, don't be so hard on yourself, but also be open to ways to improve. Yeah. And, and like Elizabeth said, you know, this, you know, you can look at this through the media lens, but you can print this out for any interaction that you're having, you know, with, with investors and, you know, did I tell the truth? Did I remain calm? Did I anticipate traps or, or questions that the investors were going to ask? Um, you know, did I articulate the call to action? So this can really be a checklist for every interaction that you're having um, with, with all of the audiences that we listed or, or others. Um, so that's the, the end of the presentation. Our contact information is here up on the screen. And I know, I, I don't know um, if there are any questions, but we'll take them if they've come in. That's okay. It's all great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Kristen, for all this valuable, very valuable advice. I think it's uh, um, probably a little bit overwhelming where, where you're sitting versus where the client is sitting uh, two very different places, right? Which is why you're needed because it feels overwhelming and the need to be reactionary or feeling that you have to just say something without that strategy in place. I mean, some places don't have the communication strategy before this happened or didn't have a hold on it, which just makes it that much harder. Um, so this is awesome and amazing. And I think that um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in and I had one of my own, um, I wanted to, well, actually they're comments, but um, I wanted to actually touch upon something with authenticity because I think that is so, so key, but it's also something that Gen Z's or the younger generation has forced the importance of. And to be fair, um, you know, spin and PR having its roots less than maybe a half a century to a little bit more ago. It's not that long ago that the invention of spin mm -hmm. and sort of manipulating the truth started. Thus the profession that we, you know, a lot of us uh, wound up in. But authenticity doesn't make communication any less important. It just says, we're gonna really pay attention to how you communicate. But the younger generations that are forcing that um, prioritization also, read Twitter and on, or on Instagram and much less on Facebook and email. So what would you say about authenticity and then channels? And is there a choice or is it you've got to do all of it? Or, and we know with Twitter, look at what, look at how much more is discussed over Twitter in 144 characters than in other ways. So just your comments on that and then any other questions? And I have a couple, couple other ones too. 
Go ahead. You know, I, I think that, you know, it goes back to where your audience lives, right? You know, so the, the Gen Z, the millennial, every audience is important, right? We don't want to discourage or uh, disregard any audience. But there are some that are more important for certain organizations. You know, Elizabeth and I have spent a lot of our time in the tech space. And so our clients are in IT security and now healthcare tech. And so they might not be speaking to certain audiences. And if that's the case, don't worry about engaging on those certain channels, right? If your audiences don't live there, stay away, right? Like if there's, I would rather, I tell clients, if you can stay away from Instagram or if you can, you know, not engage in certain channels all the time, why would you, you know, it's, it, it's not, it takes up too much time and it's not relevant. So you have to go where your audiences are. If they're there, then, you know, um, authentic conversations, video, um, unedited video or shortened video is really important nowadays, right? Like not get a film crew in, but CEOs who are using their cell phones to take videos um, yeah. can be really authentic. I would agree with that. I think that, that whether, whether it's Twitter or Instagram, I mean, I think video is so important right now, but there's ways that video can be seeming, can be very fake. Um, and you see these like, you know, canned like customer testimonials and it just, it's, uh, it's, it's very much a commercial for the company, but having that CEO walking and doing like a, a video and talking to you is we're seeing that more and more, especially on LinkedIn. I'm loving what I'm seeing on LinkedIn with people doing that. You mm -hmm. see that much more on Twitter, but you're seeing these like C-level folks just, you know, using their devices and, and talking to you like a human being. And I think that's true of any medium, whether they're talking to you on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, it's just be human. Be, being authentic means to be human. Yeah. So. And ask, like we said that, you know, you can ask questions. If you put some stuff on social media as, as a CEO of a company, and you want some feedback, ask either some customers you're having a conversation with, ask a friend who, you know, d doesn't you know, pay attention to what it is that you do and say, how does this feel to you? I mean, I think that that is overlooked, not used nearly enough of this, you know, ability to just ask somebody for feedback, either because we're scared of what we're going to hear or we don't want to have to act on it. But, you know, it's, it's like a relationship. It's, it's, it's like a marriage. I say, you know, if, if I do something, I need to know if, if, that's going to work in this relationship or if it's not and if it's not then let's figure out how to how to fix it so ask questions get feedback that's really true i think that the the um the idea that there should be or that it's not a problem it's actually a logical um follow through is that when you have this kind of need for either crisis communications or post-crisis communications, expect it to be challenging, expect it to be a multi-dimensional conversation. And just, just as a point of, of reference, you know, uh, my husband's company, they had a daily meeting for four months just to talk about how, how to handle everything, internally, right. externally, um, that's every day at four o'clock and they just went to once a week. So it's like, and it was useful yeah. because they just needed to, as executives, they needed to talk so they could be ready to answer whatever it is that was coming their way internally, not to mention externally. So that's intense, you know, but you have to make a decision to be committed to that um, so that you can communicate uniformly and everything. So mm -hmm. um, awesome. So I have a one question that I think is a great one for those who are still on board with a, a couple of people who have bumped off. I know we're going to not have too much more time, but who should be involved in the communication strategy process? Because I think small organization or large, really difficult to, for that accountability. Or I would say, you know, as, as many decision makers as possible, Kristen and I always say that it shouldn't just be, obviously we, we always say the CEO, of course. Oh my God. But, you know, we're putting a lot of emphasis on speaking to sales. We'd love to hear from sales because they're going out and selling whatever the product is. We'd love them to be in, the, in, the, in that room when we're deciding on messages and strategy uh, because they're actually talking to the customers, which in, through our lens is sort of like they're talking to, they may as well be talking to the media, right? It's like they are listening to the pain points that the customer has and they're fixing what's, what's, what they need. They're delivering the solution. So I would say... I mean, table stakes, clearly the CEO. Um, sometimes if the organization is, is large enough, the CMO, uh, marketing folks, obviously, but I would also add sales to that uh, because 
again, they're sort of living, they're sort of walking in the trenches. They're, they're living this day to day. Yeah, I mean, Elizabeth and I go into companies and I will tell you uh, over the, the past 15 years of being an agency that comes in and works with, with companies, probably 98% of them do it incorrectly. Um, and th there's a very small percentage of people who are, are who do it correctly where everybody is in the room. Um, like Elizabeth said, you know, a lot of times the CEO or the, you know, the executive will come down and say to the marketing team, whoever that is, create a communication strategy and, you know, either run it by me or run with it. Um, that is a, a huge mistake. You want the CEO to be involved as much as sheer he can in the process because they're running the company. They have a lot of feelings about what needs to happen. Like Elizabeth said, all other executives, if the company is big enough, the, the CEO, the, the C-level, um, VP of sales. Um, and if it's a data company, you, you need the, the data scientists to be involved. And, and the reason is, is all of those people are going to, to have some value to add to the external communications and the messages that you're taking out. And you don't want to overlook somebody that comes in with a different perspective. And that's the biggest problem that I see in every organization that we go into is that they, they don't anticipate that that person has value to add and they leave them out. And um, it's a mistake for, for the, 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 the benefit and the value of, of the plan. And so, you know, you need people with different perspectives for sure. And I would add HR to that if it's a large mm -hmm. enough organization, you know, we, we are hearing more and more from reporters that they want to know the values of the company. They want to know what do you stand for, especially in today's re the reality that we're living and working in. What are the company's values? And I think having HR at the table is super, super helpful. Yep. And you need a representative from each of your audiences. So employees is an audience and HR is the representative for them. And so I would say if you're looking at it, put that checklist, put down who your target, who your key audience is that you're engaging or that you need to engage with the communication strategy and make sure that you have a representative internally for each of those audiences. Mm -hmm. And I think that culture of the company makes a big difference on some of those decisions too. Mm -hmm. right? and oh, absolutely. That's not yeah, sure. And we see yeah. that all the time. Overnight, you know, we, right? Yeah. We'll see people say, yeah, they don't need to, it's just us, just let's keep it yeah. small, let's keep yeah. it to us. It's like, yeah. Actually, it'd be a lot better if you opened it up to more voices, but that's reality too. Yeah. We see that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I know. I one thing I would love uh, examples before we we end, and I think one more, the question, which is an examples of effective media during the pandemic. If you had to say one or two brands. Um, who you think really has done a good job? Would it be Nike who came out with, you know, um, just don't do it or whatever it was? Would it be, um, what would you say from your observation who's handled it well that you know of? If I like the, is it Apple that has the commercial that about the remote working? I think there's a commercial around humanizing remote workers, humanizing that we're all suddenly working from home and that we're hearing other children's, uh, you know, other kids in the background, we're seeing people's real lives. So companies that have done that, that make you feel something, but that make you feel like we're all in this together, like this is crazy, we're in a pandemic, we're communicating, and we're constantly on Zoom and there's funny things that are happening, right, during these calls sometimes. And I think I think it's the Apple commercial, that, that I, if I'm not mistaken, but um, to me that's resonated. Just, well, I think they've done a great job of, of making this a little lighter, but also it makes you feel something. Yeah, and you know what's really interesting is a lot of brands jumped really quick on the, we're all in this together, right? So I mostly listen to, to my news. I'm, I'm mostly listening to NPR, so I'm not getting a ton of the like TV commercials. Um, but you know, a lot of the brands jumped on that real quick, like we're in this together and let's hold hands. And it became a little bit too much. Yeah, too much. And cause you go, okay, we know we're in this together. But I, I focus my, perspective. Like I, I focus my attention on the brands that have had to shift their business models, right? For for example, like the all of the the tonight, like the TV shows, the Daily Show, the so now the social distancing show with Trevor Noah and Jimmy Fallon and Stephen Colbert. And the the folks that had to change the way they deliver things. At first it was we're going to take a break. And then all of a sudden it was like this break is going to be a long one. So we're going to be doing it from our homes. And, and I appreciate brands and individuals and executives that can say, 
What moment are we in? How can we adjust to reach our audiences and figure out how to do so? And, and there's some brands out there who've done a really great job like that. So um, that, you know, I would say, and, and Apple, to, to Elizabeth's point, I don't know about the commercial, but they put out like a, they put out that like three minute commercial mm -hmm. um, about the, the, the hell that it can be to be working from home. I just think it, it humanizes things because yeah, it's, and it's, there you just go things that are happening, you know? Yes. Yes. For a brand to say, we get it. We know that it sucks. You know, it's not um, perfect, is appreciated. But it, yeah. <laughs> but I think the point about the, the days, the, the news shows, I mean, the um, talk shows, like, for example, like Jimmy Fallon, I think he's done a great job. Like his kids yeah. are, you know, they have little cue cards that they make up and it just, mm -hmm. it just really humanizes it. Yeah. yeah. And imagine they're following after this, you know, they're like Elizabeth said, they're humanizing it. So now all of a sudden you're seeing Stephen Colbert in this little guest room. Yeah. And realizing that they're so much more like us than we thought that they were. And, yeah. and so it just, it goes a really long way to their personal brand as well. So it's true, especially with the talk show or comedians or people. Yeah. yeah. It's all about them. Mm -hmm. So wonderful. Thank you both so much for this. Appreciate it. It's fantastic. I think that um, if it's okay to share the presentation too, the, we can share it if you're open to it. If not, either way, your information is here and we have the video, so it's fine. Um, and thank you for everyone who attended, and we hope to see you soon, and good luck helping. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Rachel. Good luck out there, everybody. Thank Stay you. safe. Bye-bye.